as a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump. Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and things are heating up in the political 2024 landscape, including Mitt Romney saying today he announces he won't seek re-election in 2024. Quote, at the end of another term, I'd be in my mid-80s. Frankly, it's time for a new generation of leaders. I tweeted this, how utterly ironic that it's Romney who is doing the respectful and appropriate thing and just retiring. Hint to everybody out there running in 2024 who will be over 80 by the time their term has ended. So obviously this includes not just Joe Biden, not just Donald Trump, but also members of Congress, McConnell and uh, Dianne Feinstein and so many others that are Republicans and Democrats. I support a constitutional amendment, not just for minimum age requirements, but maximum age that you can be engaged in running for any federal office. I think that is high time. But what does this have to do with 2024? Well, the landscape is shaping up very interestingly with the now impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden. And so we're going to be talking to a couple of members of Congress uh, later on uh, tomorrow morning in my radio program and also on the podcast tomorrow. So definitely come back for that. Subscribe wherever it is that you stream for free so that you can get that episode as soon as it drops. But today we're also going to focus on the Democrat side of the ticket. So much of the contest and controversy has been focused on the GOP with everyone thinking, well, Joe Biden is just a shoe in Does this impeachment inquiry change anything? And does Biden's age and obvious uh, mental issues have any sort of relevance in terms of whether he will stay in or drop out possibly as early as November? But my guest today, Joel Gilbert, says that Michelle Obama is actually the one that is going to get the Democrat nomination in 2024. He has a brand new film on Salem Now. So definitely live stream that on Salem Now. That is Michelle Obama 2024 and why he thinks she's already back in politics and maybe never left. So stick around. We'll be talking to Joel Gilbert coming up next. With inflation, the banking world collapse, and everything that Joe Biden is doing not to protect America, you need to make sure to secure your financial health, especially in retirement. And hey, if you're a millennial like me, that actually is sooner than you think. You need to start now, even if you are a millennial or a Gen Zer, to make sure that your financial health is actually healthy when we get to retirement. And Legacy Precious Metals has a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in gold and silver online in real time. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped right to your door. You'll have access to a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar, and this puts you in complete control of your money. The platform is free to sign up for. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and against a volatile stock market. A truly diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but different asset classes. This brand new platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Visit LegacyPM.com to get started. You can download the free investor's guide and you can also call Legacy PM Investments to talk to a portfolio expert to get expert answers to your uh, to customize your personal portfolio. So visit LegacyPMInvestments.com to get started. Tell them that Jenna sent you. So joining me now is Joel Gilbert, who is a filmmaker and author of the brand new book, Michelle Obama 2024. So uh, Joel, this is a fascinating question that even as of the last presidential cycle, a lot of uh, Democrats and Republicans were speculating that Michelle Obama might toss her hat into the ring. I think with everything going on, especially now, this latest impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden, uh, the speculation has ramped up even further that Democrats are going to have to find another candidate. What about Michelle Obama? 
Yeah, look, I make the case in my book. It's also a film, by the way, Michelle Obama 2024. It's a book and a film. I make the case that Michelle really has been running for uh, president for several years. And she's been pretty much following the same uh, formula that Barack did. Barack was the keynote speaker for John Kerry in 2004. Michelle was the keynote speaker for Joe Biden at 2020 at the Democrat convention. Barack wrote two autobiographies, Dreams from My Father and The Audacity of Hope. Michelle wrote two autobiographies, Becoming and The Light We Carry. They're both also on Netflix. And uh, Michelle has a voter registration organization called Project Vote that's supported by the Soros gang, about $26 million organization. Same thing that Barack did. He had a voter registration organization called Project Vote. So Michelle is the best loved Democrat. And I think that the Democrat Party has set it up for her. They moved the first primary out of Iowa. So instead of campaigning in 100 counties, they moved it to South Carolina, where uh, half of the Democrat Party electorate for the primary vote is going to be African-American. It's also a state that Michelle claims as her adopted home state because her grandparents are from South Carolina. And they moved the Democrat National Convention to Chicago, of all places, her hometown. So I think it's coming. I'm predicting that Biden will drop out in November for any number of reasons, health or impeachment or pardoning Hunter. And the party will turn to Michelle, who's been preparing for that moment for some time. And I think this is also interesting coming off the heels of uh, Governor Gavin Newsom out of California that um, people, including me, have said, you know, he's kind of waiting in the wings as well. But if this is as something that's that's uh, known within the Democrat circles of those in power, then that could be the primary reason that Gavin Newsom is simply saying, you know, hey, we're going to back off. Uh, here and he's he's saying that he's not going to run. So, uh, what would have been the reason, in your estimation, that Michelle would have waited until 2024 instead of going against Donald Trump during his 2020 re-election bid? Well, I think Michelle was preparing herself. The autobiographies, uh, the outreach. She went on a world tour with both of her books. Of course, COVID interrupted it. So, I think they targeted. Uh, it was too early for her to run against uh, Trump. Uh, and I don't think Gavin Newsom is a realistic candidate. He's kind of a snarky, younger version of Joe Biden with a lot of ambition, but very difficult to relate to. Also, the Democrat Party, because of Donald Trump's inroads into the minority African-American communities by delivering with prison reform, by delivering on the economy, delivering on school choice, the Democrats felt very threatened uh, with their core voting group. And that's why they appointed everywhere they can, they appoint African-Americans to positions like the UN ambassador, the uh, minority leader in the House, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, press secretary. Their message to black voters is rather insulting. It's we look like you, so you should vote for us, you know. Uh, so but I think the Democrat Party is done with white men. Uh, they got rid of Andrew Cuomo, New York, and Gavin Newsom doesn't fit the bill. Michelle simply checks all the boxes and allows the media to attack anybody who doesn't agree with her on the basis of race and gender. Yeah, which is exactly what they've uh, been trying to do anyway with uh, their attacks against Donald Trump and anyone in the GOP, um, even people who look like uh, Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy or have the gender of Nikki Haley, while they're still somehow misogynist and racist him because they're right. you know somehow white or male adjacent, which is totally ridiculous, of course. But uh, if Michelle was the candidate, obviously that would give them a little bit more ammo for those types of attacks. So why wouldn't Democrats just be open with this when Joe Biden is clearly failing? He can't even read off of a teleprompter. There are any variety of reasons that he would step down or simply couldn't handle re-election. Why would they be playing hide the ball? Well, I think, uh, look, I don't think Biden was actually going to announce for president. It was only because RFK Jr. announced. And a week later, Biden put out a video of all things. It's not an actual announcement saying he was running. And he has, doesn't have a campaign office, no campaign manager. He's doing no campaigning. So I think it's pretty much been the plan all along. Even Biden said when he ran in 2020, he said, oh, I'm a traditional, I'm a transitional uh, you know, person. I'll hand it off to the next generation. There's just universal agreement on all sides that Biden won't be running in 2024. And the biggest uh, group that doesn't want him to run is the down ballot Democrats, state senators, congressmen, governors, you name it. They're terrified that Biden would bring down the ticket. And there'd be nothing better than Michelle Obama, who's probably the most popular person in the country, if not the world. She's had 15 years of all positive publicity, uh, magazine covers, interviews, books, you name it. So I, I think it's coming. And uh, 
this is how they want Biden to step aside. So Michelle can come in and kind of reluctantly and say, well, you know, I don't like politics, but I love this nation and I want to help out kind of as an outsider, like kind of like Trump did. Yeah. And and really, I mean, that was a little bit of what her husband was very famous for, for saying, you know, we want change and we need to upset uh, the regime. And so coming in with that messaging that worked well for him uh, may be a very good angle. And I'm speaking with Joel Gilbert, who is the author and filmmaker of the brand new uh, movie and book, Michelle uh, Obama 2024. And you got that up on the screen. And so only the truth can stop her. I like that that uh, that tagline. And, um, and so you bring up the interesting quandary for the Democrats of the RFK Jr. factor. And I think this is really fascinating because so many moderates and independents and even Democrats have really signaled that they are done with the extremism of the Biden regime and even of uh, what was really a third term of Barack Obama. So if Michelle is going to come in and challenge RFK, um, how do you see that working out among the base that isn't just solely dedicated to Michelle? Because she's obviously a lot more likable than Joe Biden. Well, look, I don't think RFK Jr. really fits the modern progressive socialist Democrat Party. He's kind of become more of a libertarian, kind of a throwback. And I don't think he'd be any problem at all for Michelle Obama. Uh, I went to her book tour event here in Los Angeles at YouTube Theater, and it was like a campaign event. People came two hours early. They were screaming for Michelle. I mean, she has the enthusiasm and she's the most loved Democrat. But as I point out in my film and book, she is vulnerable. And her biggest vulnerability is her phony life story. Her background life story is just as fabricated as Barack's. Uh, Michelle tries to claim that she's just an ordinary black person from the south side of Chicago. And she suffered all this discrimination growing up. It's a complete lie. She's not from the south side of Chicago. First of all, she's from South Shore, which was a middle class community on Lake Michigan. She spent her childhood running away from the black community. Her and her brother went an hour, an hour and a half away from their home to avoid studying in the all black schools. The kids beat her up for acting white and talking white. Michelle talks about in her book, getting in a fist fight with a girl who called her an Oreo, meaning you're black on the outside, but white on the inside. It's like a major insult. And then Michelle got her revenge on the black community uh, in Chicago in her career. She worked for the mayor of Chicago and she made 20,000 blacks homeless when she knocked down the projects at Cabrini Green and gave away the land to Tony Resco and these Democrat donors that wanted the land. Then she worked for the University of Chicago Medical Center, where her job was to kick black people out of the emergency room. If you showed up from the South Side, she would put you in a van and ship you back to these crappy clinics to make more money for the white liberal elites. So she made millions of dollars exploiting the black community. And she's trying to make them think she's one of them, but she's not. She's very vulnerable on that. Black voters are no fools. If they saw my film and when they do see it, they realize that Michelle uh, really didn't like black people, has no black friends. She married a biracial man. She moved to Martha's Vineyard and she really has nothing in common with the black community. It sounds actually a lot like she has a lot in common with uh, Kamala Harris in terms of, you know, trying to identify with this community. But if you actually look into the history of her time right. in California um, and and everything that she did uh, as a prosecutor there, that really, frankly, wasn't good uh, for the black voter, the black community. And yet she has become uh, before I think before she ascended to the vice presidency, she was a lot more popular and uh, people thought that she could have handled uh, the presidency. So what do you make of that element as well? Well, where um, Kamala, I don't think, is the heir apparent, even though uh, some Democrats are simply suggesting that because she is the current uh, vice president. But I don't see her in any way capturing the um, the imagination and simply the awe of the Democrat Party in, in the same celebrity type way that Michelle does. Right. Well, the, the name of the game in the Democrat Party is to keep and get that core voting group of 95, 99 percent of black voters to help propel them toward the presidency. Now, Kamala Harris grew up in Canada, not in the United States. Her mother's from India, her father's from Jamaica. She's not African-American. Uh, she has no experiences in common with African-Americans. So I don't think the black community even considers uh, Kamala Harris to be one of them. Now, Michelle Obama, her father was a precinct captain growing up in Chicago. Michelle's father worked for the Democrat party machine. His job was to get black voters to come out for the white liberals. Michelle followed in his footsteps. She got these jobs 
abusing and exploiting the black community to make a lot of money for white liberals. But Michelle wants black voters to think that I'm just one of you. She, one of her biggest lies she's told for 15 years that I discovered, she talks about how her high school counselor racially profiled her about going to Princeton University. She said, the counselor said, you're black, maybe you're stretching going to Princeton. Well, I found out her high school counselor was a church going black woman named Nan King. There's no way she racially profiled her. The worst thing she could have said to Michelle was, Michelle, you've got low test scores. You might want to apply to some backup universities in case you don't get accepted. That's the word. We've all heard that. So Michelle tells lies to manipulate uh, the black community into thinking that she's just one of them when she really spent her life either running away from them. She was doing white flight in the 70s. She was running away from studying with blacks and then she exploited them. So uh, that's her biggest vulnerability. I don't think Kamala Harris really has any chance against Michelle, nor does RFK Jr. Michelle would be a formidable candidate. And if Donald Trump ran against her, he'd have to start by saying things like, Michelle, are you going to apologize for what you did to the black community in Chicago? Michelle, how many millions did you make denying access to health care to black people? That would open up the conversation where black voters could see that Michelle Obama is no friend of theirs. And what about um, some of these other theories or, you know, maybe they can be typified as conspiracy theories, but some of the other potential vulnerabilities, at least from um, some of those in the in the general Republican population that would suggest that uh, because now, you know, Tucker Carlson has aired this interview that apparently uh, Barack, the allegation is that, um, you know, he's had a gay lover. Um, there have been rumors across the board about um, Michelle's true gender, you know, whether or not there's anything uh, there or not. Uh, is that something that could potentially be a vulnerability in terms of her and uh, Barack's relationship? The only thing that I've always thought was very odd is that there have never been any pictures that have surfaced about her two pregnancies. Um, yeah. So I think that there are some questions there that maybe should be considered. Yeah, let me address that. Look, uh, look, I wrote an article. Barack grew up from a young age with five gay men in his life. He had very strong relationships with gay men. Now, whether or not he did something or had homosexual relationships, no one really knows or will ever know. But Michelle Obama is actually a better politician than Barack. She's more popular. She's a better speaker. She comes across more authentic. Now, the joke that uh, Joan Rivers made many years ago, a reporter said, well, we ever have a gay president. She said, well, Obama's gay and Michelle's transgender. That's her kind of humor. And of course, the internet picked up on that. I can assure you that Michelle is 100% female. She's always been female. And uh, you know, she had the two kids through IVF. She talks about that in her book. I make the case in my film that the younger daughter, Sasha's father, is actually not Barack. So you have to read that to, to learn about it. But uh, Michelle is 100% female and all those uh, kind of innuendos that she's a dude are just not true. Michelle's biggest problem is her phoniness, is that she really is an Oreo, like the kids called her when she was growing up. She she watched Mary Tyler Moore was her hero growing up. She watched the Brady Bunch. When Barack met her, he said the family is like leave it to Beaver. He said Michelle reminded him of his white grandmother. Uh, Michelle went to all schools and worked with white people. Her best friend was Bernadine Dorn. I found that out in the film. The domestic terrorist from the 60s was a mentor of Michelle Obama. Michelle got all her anti-American rhetoric and politics of fear directly from Bernadine Dorn. I, I show that in the film. So Michelle's problem is really she identifies with white people. She moved to Hyde Park. She married a biracial man. That's her phoniness. And she's trying to trick black voters into thinking she's one of them with these very superficial things like wearing braids for the first time in her life. And she said, oh, I never wore braids before because white people couldn't handle it. You know, it, she didn't wear braids because she, she doesn't really identify as a black person her whole life. Mm -hmm. And, and so then let's assume for sake of argument that she does get the Democrat nomination and now turning to who her opponents might be. You mentioned a Donald Trump who currently, at least if you want to believe the polls, is the front runner. But now there are um, some allegations, at least that Trump is kind of abandoning Iowa and um, and at least uh, forfeiting that to Governor DeSantis or uh, the, the next uh, front runner, whether that's DeSantis or Nikki Haley or Vivek. Uh, but regardless, um, let's I think it really is coming down to a two-man race for the GOP primary, and that is Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis. So let's talk about both of them, because um, if Trump does win the nomination, he goes up against Michelle. I can only imagine uh, some of the insults that may be flying her way and um, how that 
probably won't resonate, uh, quite frankly, with uh, her constituents and the people who really do like her as almost a comparison, I think, to, to somebody like Oprah. I mean, she does like her politics or not. Um, I think you're right that she's a great politician. She's also a really great celebrity in that she has a fan base. So um, so Donald Trump versus DeSantis, who has the better shot? Well, I think it's clear that DeSantis has uh, uh, hurt himself by exposing himself to voters. The more voters hear him and see him, he comes across a little nervous when he talks. He's not telegenic. He doesn't look good on TV. He's got kind of a whiny voice. And the more voters who said, let me take a look at Ron DeSantis because of his record in Florida, the more they get to look at him, the less they want to vote for him. So I don't see DeSantis as having a serious challenge to Donald Trump. I think Trump's biggest problem is these four cases in these different courts where the deep state and the Biden administration are trying to put him in prison. And he's going to have to overcome these uh, biased judges, probably biased juries, and these obstacles that are being put in place to him becoming a candidate, the, the movement to get him off of ballots. Those are really his biggest challenges. Now, if he faces Michelle, she is a pop culture phenomenon. Meanwhile, Trump has a huge passionate fan base and an excellent record as president. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Now, I think what Michelle provides the Democrats is something called plausibility. If they say Biden is winning in all the swing states by 10 percent, no one believes it. If they say Biden won the election on election night, no one believes it. If they say Michelle is winning or she won the election, you'd say, well, I guess I believe that because she's so popular. And, you know, interestingly, I mean, Trump is his own brand of pop culture icon as well. But um, but there have been a lot of, of political pundits and analysts and uh, you know, commentators who have suggested that everybody really wants to on, on all sides just doesn't want to have a repeat of Trump versus Biden. They're over that. There's a lot of trauma around that because of what was going on during the pandemic, all of the issues with election integrity afterwards, you know, just everything that goes into all of uh, that particular challenge. And so some of the uh, the political wisdom, if you will, is that the first party to ditch their Biden or Trump frontrunner has the advantage. Uh, what do you make of that in terms of a potential setup between two pop culture icons that are Michelle and Trump? Well, first of all, uh, Biden has no base of support, like 82 percent of people don't want him to run. He never drew a crowd. He doesn't draw a crowd today. So Biden doesn't have that base of support at all. Trump does have a base of support. Wherever he appears, people come out in, in the thousands. So Trump brings along a movement with him and a very solid record. Back in 2016, he had no record. And people thought, well, maybe he's a pretender. Maybe he's a Democrat. You know, it, it's not going to work. But he does have a solid four-year record that people enjoyed a, a strong economy. We had a great foreign policy, secure borders. We had uh, energy independence. So he achieved a lot, and people want more of that. Uh, as opposed to Michelle, who can appeal to nostalgia. She'll say, remember how you love the Obama years. We never had any scandals. She told Oprah that in the interview on Netflix. We didn't have any scandals. Uh, you know, she'll appeal to that nostalgia. And there's nothing that Democrats love more than the Obamas and the Obama years. They, they aspire to that. You might remember when Barack went to the White House last year, he was mobbed by the staff, which are all his staff, pretty much. And poor Joe Biden was wandering around behind him and tapped him on the shoulder and uh, Obama ignored him. So uh, I think we are coming to a, uh, a clash of two movements, Michelle Obama and the uh, Democrats and her immense popularity against Trump and his legions of, of MAGA supporters. Wow. Well, uh, and I'm talking to uh, Jill Gilbert, who is the filmmaker and author of Michelle Obama 2024. And uh, this is all really fascinating. And I think um, that you're right, at, at least insofar as Joe Biden can't possibly be the nominee. And I think that uh, whether it's Michelle or someone else that's waiting in the wings, there have been a lot of speculation and rumors. But do you think she actually wants it? Uh, that's the one other speculation of people saying, well, hey, you know, she's yeah. retired. She's living a good life with Barack. Why would she possibly want to go back into politics? But from what I'm hearing, you're saying she's already there. Yeah, Michelle is a political animal. She grew up with a politician father, a precinct captain. She married a politician. She was so political back in 2008, you might remember, she was speaking to huge crowds, bigger crowds than Barack on her own, trashing the United States from her pal Bernadine Dorn. So she was so political, she went over the top one time and said, 
for the first time in my life, I'm proud of my country because Barack won a, a primary. Now, she said a lot worse things than that, but the media picked up on that. And the Obama campaign told her, they said, look, we, we could lose because of you. People are going to hate you. So she got a speechwriter and she came up with a new line. She said, oh, oh, I hate politics. I just want to be the mom in chief. So she kind of took a step back so that Barack could get elected. But it's very much a co-candidacy. It was always a co-candidacy and a co-presidency like the Clintons. She just didn't let people know about it. But the media ran with that idea that she doesn't like politics. Now, all politicians hate politics. It's just that they love the power part of it. They don't like the politics part of it. So Michelle has kind of slid by on that idea. And people say, oh, well, she has all this money and all these homes. They are political animals. They want power and control. I don't think they ever gave it up. Obama never moved out of D.C. They have the summer home in Martha's Vineyard, but they still live in D.C. and they meet with congressional people. They meet with the media. Uh, and if you look at Michelle's Twitter account, she's all politics all the time. So I think she's... Uh, you know, look at her running around the country, giving speeches for when we all vote, registering people to vote, working for the Soros group. Uh, she's already she's always been there. So I think it's coming. And I think November is going to be the key month because December 23rd is the deadline to get your signatures in to be on the primary ballots in all the Democrat primaries. So in November, I can see Biden dropping out. Michelle comes in and she's the only candidate who can easily get all the signatures she needs and raise you know, a couple hundred million dollars in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And you mentioned the Clintons. I mean, th this uh, this marriage and the political marriage between her and Barack does uh, remind a lot of people, including me, of Bill and Hillary. And I think there is still some resentment among Democrats um, and a lot of resentment, frankly, that uh, Hillary Clinton never had her opportunity and uh, never achieved becoming the first a female president. And that's something that they could get with Michelle Obama. And I think that a lot of Democrats would find that very attractive and almost yeah. see that in a, a direct sense as a vindication for Hillary Clinton, even though obviously that's transference a little bit to Michelle, but it's still one of the power families uh, between the Clintons and the Obamas that they really herald as their version of Camelot, um, unlike what RFK Jr. is trying to herald all the way back to his family and historically that I think you're right that the Democrat Party has kind of just moved off of. Um, so last question for you, uh, Joel Gilbert, and this has all been really fascinating as well. Well, actually, two last questions. First, um, do you think that the age factor on any of this, particularly with uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, there's been a lot of speculation about that. Um, Mitt Romney just today has said that he's going to retire because he's going to be in mid 80s in his next term if he's elected. A lot of people have been looking at, you know, Grassley, McConnell, um, you know, all of these, uh, all of these people, Diane Feinstein, I mean, across the aisle on all sides. Um, Michelle is obviously significantly younger. And so does that play a factor at all into any of this if it is a Michelle Obama versus Trump versus Michelle and DeSantis? I think the age issue is real and people are now aware of it. But Trump defies it because he's so energetic. He gives two hour speeches. He runs around the country. You know, he really doesn't show his age. Don't forget uh, Donald Trump's parents lived to be well into their 90s. So Trump at 78 is pretty much a, a young chicken. Uh, of course, uh, Biden looks and acts like somebody who's in their 80s. And of course, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell looks even worse, like th these guys should retire. But I don't think it affects Trump because of his vibrancy and his energy. I don't think people wouldn't vote for him because of his age. Uh, and I think he'll need a strong vice presidential candidate, someone that people know will be the heir apparent that will inherit the movement after Trump's second term will help him a lot. Michelle will be 60, which is a good age. And, you know, she looks good. So I don't think that'll be an issue for her. Mm -hmm. All right. So actual last question with all of the history and understanding that that you have of Michelle Obama's uh, true roots, her true history. What to you is the most fascinating thing that uh, probably anyone listening doesn't yet know about Michelle Obama, good or bad? Yeah, uh, look, she's been promoting and pushing herself to women and minorities for the last several years, developing those relationships and that constituency because they make up such a huge part of the voting block. Uh, the biggest thing about her really is that phoniness, using the uh, wearing the braid. She puts on a phony urban accent when she's speaking to a black audience. She'll use an urban accent to pretend to be, I am just one of you. 
She calls herself South Side Girl. I'm from the South Side of Chicago, and there's nothing else you need to know about me. That's what she says. So she has a, a great insecurity uh, of her relationship with the Black community because, as I said earlier, she was doing white flight. She would not go to school with Black people when she was little or in high school. And her brother went to a Catholic school that was all white. And the, the Robinson family was not even Catholic. They wanted to avoid the Black schools one block from their house. And then, as I said, she exploited and abused Black people in her career. She got her revenge on them for, for beating her up as a kid by making them homeless and taking away their health care. So it's Michelle's phoniness, pretending, putting on a fake urban accent, claiming she's from the South Side, which she's not, claiming that she's uh, suffered discrimination, which she never did. She was in a dance class from age six till high school. She was performing with the Mayfair Dance Academy all over Chicago. Michelle went to Paris when she was in high school with her French class. I didn't go to Paris. So Michelle is a very privileged kid from an elite political family. And she doesn't want people to know that. She wants them to think that she's just one of these ordinary black folks that she exploited her whole life. And I think when this comes out, uh, black voters will not support her and they won't think that the Obamas have their interests at heart because Barack Obama did nothing for the black community in eight years. He brought in illegals, drove down wages. They took away jobs. He created racial division by embracing Black Lives Matter. Race relations fell apart because of the Obamas, and that didn't help the black community at all. It made things worse. So that's what you need to know about Michelle is her her fake manipulation of minorities is something she's been doing for many, many years, and she's doing it again right now to get power. Well, the book and the movie is Michelle Obama 2024, and the author and filmmaker is uh, Joel Gilbert. And thanks so much for coming on and sharing your insights. And, you know, November is very close, so it'll be fascinating to see uh, where we're at then and look forward to talking with you as all of this unfolds. So thanks so much. Okay. Thanks for having me today. And where can people also find the book and the film? You can watch the film on SalemNow.com. You can live stream it or on Amazon Prime Video. And then the DVD and book versions are available on Amazon.com. Excellent. All right. Salem Now. Always great to promote that. So thanks so much. With inflation, the banking world collapse, and everything that Joe Biden is doing not to protect America, you need to make sure to secure your financial health, especially in retirement. And hey, if you're a millennial like me, that actually is sooner than you think. You need to start now, even if you are a millennial or a Gen Zer, to make sure that your financial health is actually healthy when we get to retirement. And Legacy Precious Metals has a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in gold and silver online in real time. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped right to your door. You'll have access to a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar, and this puts you in complete control of your money. The platform is free to sign up for. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and against a volatile stock market. A truly diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but different asset classes. This brand new platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Visit LegacyPM.com to get started. You can download the free investor's guide and you can also call Legacy PM Investments to talk to a portfolio expert to get expert answers to your uh, to customize your personal portfolio. So visit LegacyPMInvestments.com to get started. Tell them that Jenna sent you. On MyPillow's 20-year anniversary with over 80 million MyPillow sold, Mike Lindell wants to thank each and every one of you by giving you the lowest price in history on his MyPillows. You will receive a queen-size MyPillow for only $19.98. The regular price is $69.98 and just $10 more for a king size. You'll receive deep discounts on all MyPillow products such as bed sheets, mattress toppers, pet beds, mattresses, my slippers, which I love, and so much more. This is the time to try out some of the amazing products you've had your eye on from MyPillow. So go to MyPillow.com 
and enter promo code Jenna to receive this amazing offer on the queen size MyPillow for $19.98. You can go to MyPillow.com or call 1-800-564-8475. Be sure to use the promo code Jenna. This offer comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money, ba- money back guarantee. It's time to start getting the quality sleep you deserve. This offer comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. It's time to start getting the quality sleep you deserve. Go to MyPillow.com, use the promo code Jenna.